Welcome to God and Country Biblical Exposition. On this week's program, I'd like to talk about the polarization around President Trump. People either love him or hate him, and it's pretty much down party lines. Uh, for lack of a better term, this is what the right calls Trump derangement syndrome, which is the left's hatred of Donald Trump, so much so that he can never do anything right. Everything that's wrong with the world is Trump's fault or the fault of people who hold to his similar ideology or policies. And it's he's so bad that he has to be taken out of office by any means necessary, even if it means lies and violence. So this is TDS, Trump Derangement Syndrome. And I've covered this subject in the past, but we ought to look at it again because it's so fascinating. That one person or policy can be loved by one group and yet be hated so much by another group. And we ought to discuss this again because it's so biblical. This is the conflict we read about from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, the Bible is all about this war between two worldviews and the policies that flow out of these two worldviews. And ultimately, the polarization in this world is between those who support the worldview and the policies of the Lord Jesus Christ and those who support the worldview and the policies of Satan. And people will show which side they're on in this stage called the world by supporting particular political parties, lifestyles, and policies that reflect their allegiance. And there is actually a sliding scale between each side. Some people are moving more toward the right, and other people are moving more toward the left. Satan and his angels are fully confirmed in their position, but mankind is still in transition, moving either in the direction of the path of the righteous or moving in the direction of the path of the wicked. Or as it says in Isaiah chapter 38, you're either on the highway to holiness or you're on the highway to hell. And those who are on the highway to holiness by faith in Christ may not be very far down the road, but at least they're on the road. Uh, they have entered the narrow gate. C.S. Lewis wrote in Mere Christianity, People demand that they should see the whole world neatly divided into two camps, Christian and non-Christian, and all the people in the first camp at any given moment should be obviously nicer than all the people in the second. This is unreasonable on several grounds. The world does not consist in 100% Christian and 100% non-Christian. There are people, a great many of them, who are slowly ceasing to be Christian, but who still call themselves by that name. Some of them are clergymen. There are other people who are slowly becoming Christians, though they do not yet call themselves so. Now, when some Christians read this statement by Lewis, uh, they think that Lewis is denying the doctrine of justification and regeneration. But Lewis isn't talking about that. He's talking about how we th see things on a human level. He's talking about growth in Christ, how the Christian often starts out as immature, untaught, sometimes looking very much like the unsaved, but growing very slowly into the image and values of Christ. And Lewis is writing about the unsaved, often raised in a Christian culture, who are slowly departing from it. But I'm digressing from my main topic. My point is that in the political realm, it's not as if one party or candidate is purely following the law of Jesus Christ and the other party or candidate is purely following the lawlessness of Satan. But one candidate or party in its platform may more reflect the biblical worldview following biblical law and the other party reflects a more humanistic view uh, following lawlessness to some degree. And the voters will vote according to the disposition of their soul. For example, this divide took place in America back in the 19th century. The Democratic Party was pro-slavery. The Republican Party was anti-slavery. At the very least, if the Democrat Party was following the law of God, their position should have been that slaves ought to be released after six years. But no, 
the party rejected God's law in this matter. Now, today the battle is over abortion and homosexuality and gender and communism. One party is following what God's law says about all this. Uh, the other party is following the will of man. Since time began, the battle of the ages is God's authority versus man's authority, God's law, or man's opinion. What man in his uh, sinful condition desires. So, I'd like to cover three points. First, why do they hate Trump? Second, what is the effect of hating Trump and the worldview he represents? That second point I will get to next week. And third, what does this all mean? So first, why do they hate the president? Kamala Harris said in the recent debate, the American people have witnessed what is the greatest failure of any presidential administration in the history of our country. Uh, Biden said of Trump in his, in his debate that he's a liar, a racist, the cause for all of the unrest in our country. Biden likened Trump to Hitler's PR man, uh, Joseph Goebbels. I really don't have to give you many examples of the hatred coming from the left. Everyone knows that the knives are out. Uh, the Democrats just hate the president. Here's a piece from U.S. News. Democrats, Republicans, and the new politics of hate. In a deeply divided nation, Democrats and Republicans don't just disagree. They hate each other. Quote, Americans not only disagree... According to an in-depth study of the nation's culture war and partisanship, they have dramatically different values and perspectives on America itself, with the pluralism that once united the country now serving to divide it. And it's not just a matter of different opinions on policy, says Robert Jones, CEO of PRRI, a nonpartisan group that studies politics, culture, and religion. People have largely picked a side, and they really don't like the other one. Several decades ago or a generation ago, partisanship was something people took to the ballot box. Uh, today, it's something we bring home and take to bed. It's very personal. It's very visceral. Uh, nearly half the country, 48%, think the Republican Party has been taken over by racists, a view held by 80% of Democrats. And concerning the Democratic Party, nationally, 44% think it's been taken over by socialists. And 82% of Republicans share that opinion, according to the study. Uh, the two major parties themselves, Jones says, have largely come to reflect two Americas, with Republicans encompassing white Christians who feel victimized by the culture and social changes, and Democrats, the African Americans, Latinos, and women who are driving many of those demographics and social changes. Now, I would object to that last paragraph where Robert Jones claims that the divide is based upon race, white Christians versus African Americans and Latinos. It's actually white liberals who are driving most of the social change, not the minorities. And Christians on the right do not feel victimized. As usual, secular writers are clueless concerning cause and effect. Daniel chapter 12 None of the wicked will understand. But this author is right concerning the divide we have in the nation. The hatred is building. And, you know, we all know that this discord is not something that's new. This is the way it's always been. But as Christian values erode in our country, the deeds of the flesh, anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, become more pronounced. Just to illustrate the hatred on the left, Let's look at Keith Oberman's latest rant. Trump can be and must be expunged. The hate he has triggered, the Pandora's box he has opened, they will not be so easily destroyed. So let us brace ourselves. The task is twofold. 
The terrorist Trump must be defeated, must be destroyed, must be devoured at the ballot box. And then he and his enablers and his supporters and his collaborators and the Mike Lees and the William Barrs and the Sean Hannity's and the Mike Pence's and the Rudy Giuliani's and the Kyle Rittenhouse's and the Amy Coney Barrett's must be prosecuted and convicted and removed from our society while we try to rebuild it and to rebuild the world Trump has nearly destroyed by turning it over to a virus. Remember it, even as we dream of a return to reality and safety and the country for which our forefathers died, that the fight is not just to win an election, but to win it by enough to chase, at least for a moment, Trump and the maggots off the stage and then try to clean up what they left. So, Oberman says that Trump needs to be expunged. Uh, the terrorist Trump needs to be defeated, destroyed, and devoured. And all those like him who hold to conservative ideals, they must be removed from our society while the left tries to rebuild it. How does the left plan to rebuild society? And notice that Oberman says Trump has triggered the hate. So he even bl blames his hate on Donald Trump. You know, it's, it's like an angry spouse uh, blaming his or her anger on the behavior of the spouse. It's your fault I'm filled with rage. I was such a nice person till you triggered me. So this clip is just a good example of how people are divided in their worldview. And in a moment, I'm going to give five reasons put forth by pundits and the intellectuals for the hatred, for the divide. Uh, first, tribalism, social need, misunderstanding, impoliteness, or policy and values. Now, although points number one through four may factor in, the real reason is point number five, policies and values. Everything else is a smokescreen to avoid addressing core beliefs concerning right and wrong. But before I cover this, let's recognize that there is another element. There is a spiritual dimension driving this discord and hate. The people in this world are in a moral ba battle against God, and Satan and the demons are instigators. Paul writes about people being inspired by doctrines of demons, ideologies they espouse that originate from demons, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. But the Spirit explicitly says that in latter times some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons. That's the origin of much social, political ideology. I have no doubt that Karl Marx was inspired by demons. And the unsaved are influenced by Satan. He's the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. And the spirit of the Antichrist is already at work in the world. Uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 3, and every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard that is coming and now is already in the world. So what we need to realize is that this hatred toward the right, the law of God, is not just a human thing. It's not just academic. There is a demonic spiritual element. Now, of course, the unsaved world would be very angry and hateful, even without Satan's help. But it wouldn't be so organized, so empowered, so ideological. Social pundits like Oberman and politicians are being influenced by the dominion they are under, whether they know it or not. So let's look at some of these other reasons or excuses for the hatred. First, some claim it's just a matter of tribalism. In this view, the battle is simply between Team A and Team B. It's just the color of their jerseys. That the political left hates Trump because he has taken their positions and their power in the White House. They want their team to win. And they would be fine with him if he hadn't taken their jobs. Uh, this is the view that Positions and policy really don't matter that much. All that matters is power. And politicians will say or do whatever it takes to get the job. And of course, there is an element of truth here. 
there are politicians who only care about their job and their money, and they will say anything against the other candidate or party, not because they believe it, but they want the opposition out of power so they could be in power. Now, this, again, is true to a certain extent, but it's a very relativistic view of the world, that values don't matter, that they're just a tool for power, but people are moral beings, and ideology does matter. These people want power so that they can push their values and their worldview. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 4, the corruption that is in the world through lust. Even Satan wants power for a reason, so that he can impose his worldview and his values. Most likely, Jezebel didn't kill all the prophets of Jehovah simply because she wanted power. She did it because she truly believed in the immoral freedom of Baal worship, and she hated the morality of Jehovah worship. Power actually has an end. Jezebel wanted to promote the ideology and the immorality of her pagan worldview so the world would align with her fallen sinful nature. And people don't hate Trump simply because they want the White House. It's not a desire for power alone. They want the White House to promote their agenda. The power is for the policy. Here's a second possible reason for why they hate Trump. Social need. In the Federalist Papers, written by James Madison and Alexander Hamilton, uh, written to urge the states to pass the Constitution, they wrote much about dealing with competing interests in America. But they spoke in neutral terms, where the farmers in the South had their particular needs, cheap labor, easy money, no tariffs, while the manufacturers in the no North <clears throat> needed skilled labor, tight money, high tariffs. So everything is about felt need, a person's need for survival. And the Federalist Papers were very secular in this emphasis rather than addressing the moral battle between right and wrong, uh, between God and Satan. Today it would be like people in the inner city, often racial minorities, have different needs than people in the suburbs. Uh, the people in the city and in the universities don't make anything. They live off a of trade, uh, government largesse, government jobs, while the people outside the city manufacture and are more dependent on a free market. So the claim is that this is why there's conflict, because people have different felt needs. And this is what college students will learn in your typical sociology or economic class. But this is also a very relativistic materialistic view of mankind. The truth is that people are moral beings and they have felt needs, but those needs are based upon deeper moral values. Yes, there is an element of truth to the social need theory, but that's the outward layer of the onion. Peel off the next layer and we see that our social needs are really based upon our moral values. What we believe is right and wrong, our worldview. Now, it might be said that the Sanhedrin put Jesus on the cross just because they had a fear that the Romans would come and take away their place, that it was all about their need for a homeland, John chapter 11, verse 48. But that was more of an excuse to hide the real source of their animosity toward Jesus. They put Jesus on the cross because they hated his views of God, man, sin, and righteousness. If it weren't for a hatred of Jesus and his teachings, the fear of losing their homeland wouldn't have even come to their mind. People don't hate Trump because of their social need. It goes much deeper. Uh, how about a third reason for why they hate Trump? We just don't understand each other if we would just sit down and talk more. We, we hear this argument often, uh, sometimes in subtle ways, so we need to identify it. Here's an article from Psychology Today. Why do Democrats and Republicans hate each other? We're less far apart politically than we think. Why can't we all get along? And the gist of this article is that we need more information. We need more exposure to our opponent's views. Uh, we're too isolated. Uh, here's an article from the left-leaning magazine, The Atlantic. 
Uh, Republicans don't understand Democrats, and Democrats don't understand Republicans. A new study shows Americans have little understanding of their political adversaries. And the solution put forth here is that people need to be educated more in the arguments of the other side. Well, this is a Pollyannish, uh, there is no intrinsic evil in this world view. That there is just perspective. Uh, it's not a matter of evil. They don't say it quite that way, but that's really the emphasis. The other day I was watching a documentary on the history of electricity. When the telegraph was first invented, social leaders and intellectuals uh, back in the 1850s were actually writing pieces saying that with the telegraph, there will be no more wars because people can now communicate. So even back in the 19th century, there were liberal moralists who didn't believe in or grasp the biblical doctrine of sin. For them, sin was only a function of the environment. And we would all be good if we had better resources. But we all know that the invention of mass communication in the 19th century caused the next century, the 20th century, to actually be, have more wars and more bloodshed than any other century. So I guess our problem is not communication. Communication makes it worse because we have sinful hearts. But notice how the explanation of the conflict, the explanation of cause and effect, is based upon people's worldview, what they believe about man and sin. A fourth reason given for why the left hates Trump, the excuse we hear very often, it's his bluster, his demeanor, his rudeness, as if they would love him if he wasn't so rude. He insults people by calling them names. He calls Mike Bloomberg Little Mike, um, Elizabeth Warren, Pocahontas, uh, Nancy Pelosi, Crazy Nancy. Now, many people, of course, love Donald Trump because finally someone is calling these pompous politicians what they are. Uh, but, of course, you know, this causes these pompous politicians to hate him all the more. Just like the leadership of Israel hated Jesus all the more because he called them what no one else ever dared to call them. Hypocrites, children of hell, blind guides, serpents, fools. All that's in Matthew chapter 23. So without a doubt, hatred for Trump is due in part to his comments, his rude but sometimes honest critiques of these do-nothing hypocritical politicians. But the hatred can't just be his rudeness. Because Ronald Reagan was as nice a man as a politician could ever be, and they still hated him. And they made up all sorts of lies against him. And Amy Cohen Barrett is the nicest person you ever want to meet. She never called the left derogatory names, and yet they hate her. And everyone knows that if the president were a Democrat, and he spoke in the same rude way, the left would call him an honest dealer, a humorist, a man of courage, because they cover for the rudeness and the social mistakes of their own, especially in the case of Biden. So it all depends upon policy, not personality. So number five, the real reason for the hatred of Donald Trump, despite all of his faults, is his policy. It's not just that these people want power or they have needs or they don't understand or they don't like his bluster. It's primarily about policy. That's the factor that affects all of these other reasons. Now, this may seem quite obvious. You might say, Pastor, you know, why did you have to cover those four other possible reasons for why they hate Trump? We all know this. Well, I had to cover those other reasons just as a reminder that that is their smokescreen. This is so that the opposition doesn't have to address the merits of the policy. They don't have to be exposed to moral arguments concerning right and wrong. You know, the leadership of Israel really hated Jesus because of his policy. Or rather, his teachings about the true faith and right values and what is the law of God. 
those teachings contradicted the people's worldview. They actually undermined their false ideological foundations. Now, remember the text where Jesus said, they hated me without a cause? John chapter 15, verse 23. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would not have sinned. But now they have both seen and hated me and my father as well. But they have done this to fulfill the word which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. And this is a quote from the Psalms. Psalm 35, 19. Do not let those who are wrongfully my enemies rejoice over me, nor let those who hate me without cause wink maliciously. Uh, Psalm 64, Psalm 69, 4. Uh, those who hate me without cause are more than the hairs of my head. Those who would destroy me are powerful, being wrongfully my enemies. What I did not steal, I had to then restore. Uh, Psalm 109.3, they have surrounded me with words of hatred and fought against me without cause. Jesus' statement and these verses from the Psalms do not mean that these people had no reason for the hatred. There certainly was a reason. It was envy, jealousy, greed, power. But the meaning here is that there wasn't a just cause or a righteous reason for the hatred. It was a hatred that was based upon unrighteous motivations. And yes, the leadership in Jesus' day hated the popularity of Jesus. They hated his threat to their power. But behind it all, it was his values. What Jesus taught about the true law of God, what was right, what was wrong, John chapter 7, verse 7, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify of it that its deeds were evil. And nothing's changed in the last 2,000 years. People still hate uh, Jesus' teachings and the law of Jesus and those who follow the law of Jesus. Matthew chapter 10, verse 22, you'll be hated by all because of my name. And John 15, 18, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. But you say, wait a minute, Trump and the Republicans are not Jesus. Well, of course. But the hatred toward the law of God is so great that if anyone is tangentially advocating for a policy that aligns with the Bible, the knives will come out. And that's the scary part. That those on the left actually hate the president because of his moral policy. It would actually be better if they hated him just because of his rudeness or his demeanor. But it's actually the policies that they hate. They really want globalism. They want communism. They want abortion. They want gun confiscation. They want LGBTQ. And they want to silence religious freedom. You can agree with the left on almost any position. But if you're pro-life, the hatred toward you is visceral. This is the religion of secular humanism versus the remnants of the religion of Christianity. And it was because of the biblical theistic worldview, God's law, that all of the prophets were persecuted. Jeremiah was hung in a mud pit, not because he followed Jehovah God, because everyone in his day claimed to be following Jehovah God. But they hated him because he preached that Jehovah God was against their child sacrifice, their greed, their immorality. And Isaiah was sawn in two because he said that the policies of the wicked king Manasseh were a violation of the law of God. And the Sanhedrin stoned Stephen to death because Stephen said they were not keeping the law of God. And in the Apocalypse, Revelation chapter 11, verse 10, the world will put to death the two prophets of God who will speak out against the agenda of the Antichrist. And when the prophets are put to death, Revelation 11, those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate. And they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. The people of the world see the word of God as a torment. So, we should not consider the political conflict that we're experiencing today as something unusual. This is the conflict that the Bible says we should expect in this world. Jesus, Jesus even surprised his disciples when he said to them, I didn't come to bring peace, but a sword. But you say, wait a minute. 
He was supposed to be the Prince of Peace. Yes, but not peace with the unconverted enemy. Truth. Jesus Christ will divide this world. will divide between the followers of God and his law and the followers of Satan. Do what thou wilt. And division is really not a bad thing. It must needs be that offenses come. The bad thing is being on the wrong, wrong side of the division. In the vice presidential debates, the final question came from Brecklin Brown, an eighth grader at Springville Junior High in Springville, Utah. Quote, when I watch the news, all I see is arguing between Democrats and Republicans. When I watch the news, all I see is citizen fighting citizen. When I watch the news, all I see are two candidate parties trying to tear each other down. If our leaders can't get along, how are citizens supposed to get along? And then she added, your example could make all the difference to bring us together. Well, this, this question was chosen by the debate commission, not for Brecklin, Brecklin's sake, but they wanted to make the point uh, that the right needs to give into the left so that we all get along. So Pence came up with an anemic response. It was, it was kind of all right, that we should all be like Ginsburg and Scalia, that although uh, Ginsburg was on the far left and Scalia was on the far right, they were very close friends. Uh, Pence says, when the debate is over, we come together as Americans. Harris said that this is what Joe and I plan to do, bring the American people together, not like the hatred and division under President Trump. Uh, but I would like to ask Kamala, who is causing the division and the hate? Ahab, the king of Israel, he went to the prophet Elijah and he called the prophet the troubler of Israel. First King chapter 18, verse 17. But then Elijah turned and rebuked the king and said to him, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and you have followed the Baals. But notice in this, the perception on the part of Ahab and Jezebel is that it's all the fault of the conservative prophet. It may have looked to Ahab that Elijah was the troubler of Israel because of his insistence on the law of God. And it may have looked as if Jesus was the troublemaker in Israel. But the ones who are responsible for the hatred and division are the ones who do not follow the word of God, as Elijah says in 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 18. Amos chapter 5, verse 10. They hate him who reproves in the gate, and they abhor him who speaks with integrity. So my answer to Brecklin Brown would be, Miss Brown, the goal is not to get along. The goal is truth and righteousness. We need to fight evil, not make peace with evil. There is conflict in our nation right now because there are some very important issues at stake literally matters of life and death. The real important things are things about which men will fight. Having no conflict with evil would actually be worse than no conflict. Pray that righteousness wins the day, Brecklin. And God says that in the end, it will win. Well, that's all I have time for. Next week, I'll pick up this subject and again, look at some of the effects of this hatred, um, the lies and the distortion coming from the left. Thank you for taking the time to include God and country as part of your discipleship in the word. Uh, appreciate so much your prayers and support. Don't forget to subscribe, comment and share and may Jesus Christ reign.